Go! 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 No doubt the first thing you heard about Sam Mendes' 1917 is that it looks like it's all one shot. These days, shooting a movie in all one take, or in a number of long takes stitched together to look like one as 1917 is, can sound like a gimmick. The one take wonder has been done before, very well, and to great acclaim. The Oscar goes to. Who gave this son of a bitch his green card? Birdman! So, at first, you might wonder, why do we need another one? As you watch, though, 1917's continuous shot exercise feels earned, illuminating, and even in some ways unprecedented. First, because Roger Deakins' cinematography and the logistical acrobatics Mendes' team pulls off are a showcase of technical filmmaking excellence. Well, for a start, you can't really light it because, you know, if you were running down a trench and turning around 360 degrees, there's nowhere to put a light anywhere. Second, and more importantly, because there's a potent emotional effect that results from pairing a World War I tale with the immersiveness of the long take. Stay low. It's hard to point to another war movie that so effectively allows you to imagine the reality of being on the ground in a conflict that's now passed out of living memory. We still speak to this day of being in the trenches. I'm the guy in the trenches. We're in the trenches together. You leave me in the trenches taking grenades, John! But what film has shown in such thorough detail what a trench really looks like? What it would feel like to camp in one or rush through it? How fat the rats would be? The rat bites clean through his knee and runs off with it. No. <laughs> Thanks to how viscerally 1917 carries us back into the past, we can think in a more probing way about the meaning of this experience, which invented modern warfare as we know it. There is only one way this war ends. Last man standing. Here is our take on the storytelling of 1917, why it matters, and how they did it. This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. It's like your own personal film festival streaming anytime, anywhere. As 1917's title reminds us, the events of this movie are now over a century gone. Mendes dedicates the film to his grandfather, Alfred, a runner in the war, who told him the stories. My grandfather fought in the First World War. His name was Alfred Hubert Mendes. He was a messenger on the front lines. With this dedication, the director reinforces the importance of remembering, of passing down knowledge and learning from history. But through making the film itself, he also underlines that it's not enough to just retain distant facts and statistics. We have to feel the memory. And then to take these active memories into our modern world and reflect on how much of this past we can recognize in our present. Mendes told Associated Press, The winds that were blowing before the First World War are blowing again. The danger is that war is being gradually forgotten. Those that lived through it and fought in it are dead. These men were fighting for a free and unified Europe, which right now would be worth remembering. It's really important that we don't forget the people who fought in the First World War. So often, war movies are sweeping and epic, or cerebral or abstract, or they did feel immersive when first released, but their black and white film, shooting style, or older effects aren't in a language that's likely to transport younger mainstream viewers today. 1917 makes possible that form of time traveling that cinema exists for. The film in itself is a slice of time. And it might make you realize that your ideas about the Great War are ultimately rather shallow and removed. The things that these soldiers go through are horrendous. It's intimate in a way that I don't think any other war movie I've seen is. There is a lot of value in bringing World War I specifically to life in such vivid, horrifying contemporary detail. The First World War set the precedent for all that we take for granted about violent conflicts that have followed it. The First World War starts with literally horses and carriages and ends with tanks. So it's the moment where modern war, you could argue, begins. It had the first large-scale use of tanks, flamethrowers, and chemical weapons in the form of poison gas. It was the start of strategic bombing and targeting of civilians and infrastructure, harbingers of what would become much worse during World War II. It was the first war to be fought on three planes, air, land, and sea. And because this giant-scale, hugely deadly war left its soldiers so psychologically disturbed, 
It led to the first recognition of what was termed shell shock, a poorly defined precursor to PTSD. Danny, Danny, you're home. We're all home in England. You're not in France. Them was a going of the lucky ones. The story of 1917 is unusually simple. You have a brother in the 2nd Battalion, but they're walking into a trap. Two young British soldiers are sent on an impossible mission to race across no man's land and deliver a message that could save thousands of other young men from becoming cannon fodder. If you fail, it will be a massacre. That's pretty much it. The drama lies mainly in whether they, or one of them, will make it in time. But the narrative's simplicity is an asset to this film, because it allows us to focus purely on the experience of this maddening, soul-destroying conflict and having to look death literally in the face. Mendez pulls off something here that should be the goal of more stories, the impression of universality. As Mendez told Vox, part of the reason we cast young and relatively unknown actors as the main characters was to give the feeling that these are two young men among two million, and that they're, this is a weird thing to say, not particularly special. There's an ordinariness to them. And the anonymity of this character who turns out to be unbelievably heroic sends the message that there were countless others like him, unsung heroes now forgotten, if anyone ever knew their names. Lance Corporal Blake takes this task personally because his brother is a part of the attack that's doomed to fail. If we're not clever about this, no one will get to your brother. I will. But Lance Corporal Schofield just gets chosen by his friend to come along. Blake. Pick a man, bring your kit. With no idea that this will be the hardest day of his life. Why in God's name did you have to choose me? Meanwhile, Mendez casts some of Britain's most recognizable male actors, like Colin Firth, Benedict Cumberbatch, and Andrew Scott as officers. Their fame, compared to the leads, subtly reinforces that their characters are higher status superiors. Still, even these important men are powerless to stop or escape the never-ending battle. The fact that Colin Firth's General Aaron Moore sends these two guys with no real support or plan B betrays that he expects them to fail. This is just a shot in the dark to prevent a massacre that's almost certainly going to take place. I hoped today might be a good day. Hope is a dangerous thing. The result of its style and story is that 1917 is not truly a war movie at all. It's a decidedly anti-war movie. And that's fitting given how widespread disillusionment that came out of the Great War changed the collective psyche forever. You still think it's beautiful and sweet to die for your country, don't you? When it comes to dying for your country, it's better not to die at all. While early poetry written about the war was romantic and patriotic, later writing tried to process the brutality and shock. And our bodies are earth, and our thoughts are clay, and we sleep and eat with death. The post-World War I period gave birth to modernism, a movement that rejected past traditions and dug into the inner psyches of people reeling from the madness they'd all just endured. To better get inside people's heads, writers experimented with new forms like real-time techniques, like when Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway follows the title character for one day in her life. And we can see a descendant to this kind of writing in Mendez's 1917. Until you actually see it on a screen, you don't really realize how immersive it is and how that technique kind of draws you into it. So how did Mendez and Deacons pull off this impression that this epic cinematic war tale is happening all in one shot? There are a few spots where it's obvious they've changed shots, like the moment when Schofield blacks out and the screen goes black, or the moment when he jumps into the water. He actually landed on a mat. Anytime they go through a doorway or the screen is covered in shadow, this is a good opportunity for a possible edit. Screen Rant pointed out 34 possible spots where hidden cuts appear to have taken place. Mendez says he wouldn't even call these joins cuts, but more like blends, stitches, morphs. But according to the director, most of the shots actually last five or six minutes and can be as long as eight and a half. In some ways, the process for 1917 resembled theater, which is fitting given that Mendez himself is a highly accomplished theater director. It's like a piece of theater every take. Once it starts, it can't stop. If something goes wrong, you just have to keep going. The film required many months of rehearsals with the lead actors. Unlike in a typical film, the actors took part right from the start of the pre-production process. And so you have to rehearse every line of dialogue on location. And that's where it overlaps with doing theater, because the world has to be crafted around the rhythm of the script. 
First of all, Deacons and Mendes had to decide the journey of the camera. You have to construct a journey for the camera that's every bit as interesting as the journey of the actor. After they determined the big picture, Deacon said, It was just a technical challenge to figure out how to break our one shot down into sections so it was manageable. You have a camera being carried by an operator hooked onto a wire, and the wire carries it across more land, and it's unhooked again. That operator runs with it, then steps onto a small jeep which carries him another 400 yards. In part, the Bond director felt motivated to make this movie after he pulled off the super long take at the beginning of Spectre. So I felt like a real proper movie director. On another level, Mendez's film is an implicit critique of the conventions of film grammar as we know them today. As Mendez told Vox, we experience life much closer to one longer continuous shot. He told AP, it's editing that's the gimmick. Editing is a wonderful tool if you want to jump time, jump space, jump from one story to another. But editing is so overused in just a basic scene. Noting that a simple scene of two people talking would frequently use five or six different setups, he said, you have to ask yourself, why is that now our default? In older movies, the camera usually stays a lot longer in a given shot than it does in most movies today. Cornell psychologist James Cutting found that, in English-language films, the average shot in 1930 was about 12 seconds long. By 2010, it was just 2.5 seconds. Longer takes require consistent performances from the actors. They focus audiences on the action happening before the camera, and can't create superficial intrigue through a lot of distracting cutting around. There's always that sort of get out of jail card that you have with the movie. Well, you know, we might be able to cut around this, or we might take that scene out. So you might say 1917 is urging us to take something from the past when it comes to how we watch and appreciate film technique too. You almost have to change the way you think about how we view movies as a viewer and how we make movies as a filmmaker. The one-shot feel of 1917 is all about grounding us in time. From the very beginning, I felt this movie should be told in real time, every step of the journey, breathing every breath with these men. Mendez has said that the film operates like a ticking clock thriller. And this thriller feel is a big part of what turns 1917 into something different than all the other war movies you've seen before. If you told it in a conventional way, I don't think you would have felt the energy. The fact that we're moving always forward, it does have a compound effect, a gradual growing menace. It also reminds us that the long take, like any film technique, can be used for a wide variety of emotional effects and narrative results. While Mendes said he'd seen a number of the long-take-filled films that 1917 has inevitably been compared to, he noted that, quote, "...even the movies that are most similar to it are quite dissimilar. Birdman, for example, which is a movie I loved, is a very surreal film. It's not asking you to experience time, it's asking you to forget about it, in a way." Son of Saul, which is an absolute masterpiece, is very subjective. It's very shallow depth of field, everything drops out of focus. For all the work that the team put into this one-shot business, the camera isn't performing flamboyant tricks to draw your attention. Mendez said, We decided we never wanted the camera to go through a keyhole or follow the path of a moving bullet or pass through a wall or fly 2,000 feet in the air. The director stated his ultimate goal is that the viewer isn't thinking about the shot during 1917. So while part of the pleasure of 1917 is showcasing excellence in technical filmmaking, Ultimately, it reinforces that even the most masterful cinematography is only as good as the story it tells, the truth it uncovers, and the feeling it inspires. I wanted people to understand how difficult it was for these men. You need to trust me! Jump! This video is brought to you by Mubi, a streaming service we love. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film. Whether it's a movie you've been dying to see or one you've never heard of before, there is always something new to discover. So in this world where it's very easy to spend hours debating what you should watch, Mubi is like having a really cool friend with amazing taste in movies, making it so much easier for you. They feature hard-to-come-by masterpieces, indie festival darlings, influential art house and foreign films, lesser-known films by your favorite famous directors, and more. Plus, you can even download the films to watch offline, and there are no ads, ever. Right now on Mubi, you can check out Firas Fayyad's Oscar-nominated documentary, Last Men in Aleppo, which focuses on the Syrian civil war and showcases the heroism of a volunteer civil defense group known as the White Helmets. We can't recommend Mubi highly enough. You can try it out now for free for a whole month. Just click the link in the description below.